All right, welcome. Thanks for everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Michael Park. Uh, I work at uh, Facebook. I'm on the C++ libraries and standards team. Um, this is pattern matching. We're going to be talking about a specific proposal uh, that's already in committee today. Um, so it's P1371. Um, these are the co-authors of the paper. Um, the latest status of the paper is that we talked about it in Kona on a Saturday session. It was generally well received um, and we had great feedback. So the next thing is that we'll be taking it to Cologne in July um, and we hope to discuss it further on a non-Saturday session uh, with potentially more people. So I have two goals for this talk. Uh, one, there's two folds. One is to help you build intuition for how pattern matching works and how it can help you simplify your code. And second is for us to gain, gather feedback. Um, so ultimately, we want to deliver an, uh, deliver an awesome feature for C++. Um, and so please ask questions and make comments as we go. Um, if you see something and say, and, and if it's like ambiguous or confusing or something like that, please make that comment so that we can address it. Um, or I'll tell you that it's not actually confusing or whatever, uh, but, but, but let's make it a conversation, okay? Um, all right, so before we even get into pattern matching, uh, let me ask, first, first ask the question, how many people are actually familiar with pattern matching in some other language, um, are ex extensively experienced in it? Okay, so maybe we skip this whole section. <laughs> um, I'll cover it anyway for maybe video or whatever. Um, so before we get to pattern matching, um, there's two uh, tasks that are extremely common and they should be simple uh, in programming that we do every day, right? One is selection and the other is decomposition. By selection, I mean performing different actions based on some value. And so in this area, we have things like switch and if. Um, and decomposition, uh, we have some value. We want to retrie retrieve components out of that value to take some action. Um, and these are extremely common. We do this probably every 15 lines of code uh, we write. Uh, so let's first talk about selection and status of it in C++. Um, the first thing is switch, right? It's the first thing that you would reach for. And shortly after you start using it, of course, you realize that it's too limited. Um, I think everyone probably has had the situation where you want to just switch on a string um, and you can't do it because it's only, it, it only works for integrals. Actually, not even integrals. It works for a single integral, right? So if you even if you have just two integers, you can't just say, like, I want 0, 0. You have to nest switches to get, to get what you want. So this is, this is unfortunate. Um, on the other side, we have if-else statements, uh, that which, which I think goes too far on the other direction. So here I have a simple expression tree. Um, a classic expression tree with inheritance um, and, a, and a very naive implementation of eval. Um, so eval is probably not a good candidate to write this way. You should just write a virtual function. But an example of it would be you know, a, something that's not applicable to your entire tree. So like, see if this subtree has value 42. You wouldn't want to infest your entire uh, hierarchy with that. But let's take eval because it's a simple example. Um, so what's the problem here? Somebody shout it out. Um, this one here? Yeah, that's for negation. Yeah, so, it's, so, so sorry, let me describe the tree a little bit. So int is just the value, negation is performing negation on the expression, and then adding is adding two expressions. It's, it's both order and it's expensive to do dynamic casts. Right, so, so dynamic cast is expensive. It, this, is the, this is the biggest complaint, right? Um, but in my opinion, honestly, it's not dynamic cast's fault. And the reason I say that is because Let's say dynamic cast is as, just as expensive as a virtual function call, right? Then this being three times virtual function call is not dynamic cast's fault because it, does, it just doesn't have, doesn't have enough information, right? It's doing the best it can with what it has. The problem is really just that the if, the if else chain, this is not even an if else chain actually, this is just like early returns and stuff. And it's very difficult for a compiler to look through a, 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 a language construct that's this flexible. Um, and arbitrary and actually reason through that the dynamic cast can be uh, consolidated. So inherently, what we're looking at is a structural association of these, uh, of these conditions and values. So if you look at the switch case, uh, when we switch on a value and we have case C1 and C2, and let's say these C1 and C2 are arbitrary, arbitrarily complex expressions. Without expending C1 and C2, we can tell that C1 and C2 are used to compare against value. And, and it's, there's, a, there's an inherent association there. In the if-else if chain with b1 and b2, 
without expanding and analyzing B1 and B2, what the, what the, what the Boolean is, we have no idea if it, actually, if, it, if it has anything to do with value at all, right? So it's a lot more work for the compiler. And so this is obviously not a, a new idea. Um, this is principle of least power um, described by Tim Berners-Lee in 1998. Computer science in the 1960s and eight to 80s spent a lot of effort making languages that were as powerful as possible. Nowadays, we have to appreciate the reasons for picking not the most powerful solution, but the least powerful. And so an example of this, not in selection statements, but iter uh, iteration statements, is the difference between range-based for and while, right? With a while, you just have a Boolean expression, and so you have to place your iteration correctly um, in specific places to get what you want, whereas a range-based for embeds your intent in the const construct itself. You know what's happening um, without having to do any analysis. And so that, that enables um, compilers to perform vectorization, for example, um, as opposed to having to uh, do more analysis for that. So the second half of this is, the reason for this is that the less powerful the language, the more you can do with the data stored in that language. If you write it in a simple declarative form, anyone can write a program to analyze it in many ways. And so often, the, the program that analyzing your program is the compiler, right? So oftentimes when you hear such stuff like, oh, we can, we can optimize better, that means there's more data in your program to, to leverage. Um, in the case of switch, there are things that the compiler can do um, that, that can't do with an if. For example, um, if you have duplicate cases in a switch, the compiler can tell you. And that's inherently because there's more data stored in the restricted form of, of switch. Um, as well as telling you that there are missing cases, uh, those, those have to be warnings, but enums, uh, for enums you get missing cases, for example. And that's, and that's partially because of this inherent uh, characteristic. So this is what I would describe as kind of the um, selection power spectrum, in two uh, accounting for two factors. One is structure and the other is flexibility. Um, and we have other options in the middle here, uh, but there's a big gap, right? And so for, we mentioned virtual functions already. Um, it's, it's pretty structured in the sense that the derived implementations are still associated with the base class uh, uh, virtual functions. So you, there's some structural association there. Um, and, but, the, but it's still not all that flexible because you can only use it for a single hierarchy. Uh, Stood visit came along in C17. Everything else is about 30 years old, right? <laughs> um, so, std visit uh, is also pretty structured in that you have a variant, you, you have a visitor that associated with the variant, um, but it's, and it's maybe more flexible in that it can ha handle multiple variants, but you know, it, it, it still only works for variants, so that's, that's where it, that's, I think that's where I would place it. And then we want to go here with pattern matching. We want to increase flexibility from a switch and virtual function and these kinds of things. Um, and decrease flexibility from the if-else side uh, to get more structure and, 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 and our ability to reason about the code better. So let's talk about std visit though, because um, it's, a, it's an important candidate for us to get right. And the reason for it um, is std visit has a bad, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's too complex basically. So this article, um, it describes all of the mechanisms that you have to understand to, uh, to use to visit in a useful way. Um, so, you know, in the, in the standard way you use to visit, you'd have to declare a function, function object before you actually call this to visit, um, which is kind of backwards from how you, would, how you would use a switch, right? You wanna say, switch on this thing and here are my cases. Um, so having to say this cases ahead of time um, is, a, is, a, is a bit backwards. Um, I realize this is a bit too small, but I'm gonna read it out to you. This is a Slack conversation that I saw, uh, that I caught at some point. Um, there's a question of, at what point would you start considering std, uh, std variant over a simple, simple tagged union? And so the question was, I guess my main question would be, why are you avoiding variant? And the answer, uh, and the answer to that was the complexity of the interface. And the complexity of the interface really is just the std, vi std visit interface it's talking about. Um, so Michael's here. <laughs> Michael Spencer comes along and he says, I would almost never go with variant because using it is painful, right? And as, as someone who was very much involved in the variant uh, uh, design and, and usefulness of it, I, I care about the usability of variant. Um, and it makes me sad that variant is not being used because of std visit. So how can, we make, how can we make it easier for variant to be used? Well, Michael says, when we get pattern matching, assuming it doesn't suck, <laughs> then I'll start using variant. <laughs> okay, so again, questions and feedback so that we can make it not suck uh, and we can make variant uh, more useful. So the other half of this is decomposition. And also about this is that if you go back to the example of selection uh, with this you know, naive approach, 
Um, the main point is that not, like, probably 90% of the time after you do, select, do selection, um, you're doing decomposition to get, the f to get specific fields out that you want to do something with. Um, and so my only point about decomposition is that it comes up all the time in conjunction with, uh, with selection. So let's put these two together. What happens? So here's an example in Rust um, of nested, select, and decompose. So the enum here is kind of like a variant. Uh, so we have a message. We have quit, move, write, and change color. Um, and then we can construct an instance of message of change color, and then we can match on that. So the matches appear here, right? We can, it's pretty intuitive as to what's happening, right? You can guess as to what's happening here. Um, but it, so let me point out this axis here is the selection. And then horizontally, we're doing decomposition, right? We're doing that at the same time. Um, here's what you'd write in C++. Um, let's do the setup. Quit, move, right, and change color, separate types. We pull it together with std variant. Uh, and then we would do a, a visit on an overload. And the overload is the thing that allows you to construct an overload set out of, out of lambdas. I'm not going to cover it because it's kind of boring. Um, but the point here is, again, we select vertically, and then we decompose horizontally. Right? But, it has to, but it has to happen in, in, in two separate steps. And so this might not actually look too bad to you. But once we start doing more of them, right? So let's say that the change color command actually change a color um, uh, enum. And so it could be RGB or HSV, right? So in this case, uh, we match on message again. And we're just describing the value that we want to see, right? We want to we change color of RGB uh, and then get the pieces out, right? We're, we're selecting that way. We're decomposing that way because change color is actually uh, actually stores a, date, stores a piece of data, we're selecting again, and then we're decomposing again. Right? But the important part that I want to stress is that the value construction looks almost exactly the same as the pattern construction. And that's what makes it intuitive. Um, so here's what we have to write in C++. Uh, the left-hand side is just the setup, getting the variant color. And then we have to visit overload on the message, which is this selection. We have to decompose, which is a change color dot color, and then we have to decompose. Uh, we have to select again within that, and then we have to decompose again, right? And so you can see how this increases nesting because you have to see, have to do each of these steps uh, uh, step by step. And so the takeaways for the motivation uh, is that is that selection and decompose decomposition are extremely common operations. Uh, we want a general uh, selection mechanism between switch and if else. Selection and decomp decomposition very often nest, and nested selection and decomposition leads to indentation, um, which so, uh, I would like to, I generally like to take the level of indentation as kind of a uh, level of program complexity. All right, so what is pattern matching? This is the quote from Haskell Wiki, so we know it's correct. <laughs> It says, in pattern matching, we attempt to match values against patterns, and if so desired, bind variables to successful matches. So this information card here with the uh, uh, font and color uh, will be available in the, f in the future slides so that you can keep track of what's happening. So here's an example. Uh, I don't know why I skipped that. Anyway, so here's a, here's a Rust example. Uh, we, have a, we declare a simple point structure. Uh, we instantiate. Uh, we create an instance of point with 0 and 7. We can match on that point, and then uh, the patterns are uh, x, y equals 0, or x equals 0, y, or x and y. And so in this case, we would uh, try, to, try to evaluate each pattern in order. And so the first one would not match because y is not 0. And then the second, would second one would match because x is 0, and y can be anything. Um, and then it would print uh, y axis is 7. Pretty simple, right? Everyone follow? No questions? Good. Um, so in C++, we might, uh, we'd have to write something like this instead, where rather than describing our value, we would have to imperatively uh, take our actions uh, directly um, to, to get what we want. OK. Uh, can I ask questions to both in this way? This, in the second line, the initialization in parentheses, isn't that a C so construct? This one? Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the uh, designator, designated initialization was added in 2017? 
20. 20, yeah. So you can do this now. Um, which is kind of neat because it looks closer to Rust. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good design principle, but yeah. So yeah, th so that's a, that is allowed now. Okay, so in this view, uh, pattern matching can be viewed as a declarative alternative to manually testing values uh, with conditionals and extracting the desired components. Right, so th those are the corresponding pieces uh, that you would be replacing. So, and that, so here's, the, here, here's the pattern that we matched earlier. Um, so in this case, uh, there's, two, there's two things that we're ha that's happening, right? One is the test portion. Uh, we're testing for this point.x equal equals zero condition. Um, and the other is the extract portion. And these two things are embedded in a single pattern. Uh, and that might remind you of something that happens in regular expressions, right? So we, if we have a regular expression like this, um, there are two things happening. One is testing for uh, the, the string that we want to the string that we're looking for, um, and the other is the extracting of the portion that you want, and which happens with the parentheses. So in this view, you can look at pattern matching as kind of a generalization of regex, right? And so this is just a summary of what patterns are all about. Um, it matches, or, and it binds. And the binding uh, happens with getting access to pieces of the value that you matched, right? Pretty, pretty clear? Okay, so this is an example that we this is an example that we saw uh, a few slides ago, and in terms of identifying where the patterns are and where the bindings are, um, the color the color should tell you where that is. Um, and with uh, with our with the, with our proposal, um, the proposal is to allow writing something like this, where you could inspect on a variant and then very similarly uh, describe it with uh, describe the, the the value that you want with a pattern. More complex example from before that required a lot of nesting uh, with the paper proposal, we would be able to just describe the, what we want out of the value like this. Okay. So the key idea here is that patterns and values are both built via composition. And so what I mean by that is the, the values that we that we build in C++, right, um, are built through composition in that we have some integral, let's say, or, or literal, like 42. We might put that into a pair that might go into a struct of some sort. Um, and so we're building these patterns, or we're building these values inside out. When we inspect them, we have to do that in reverse. And so we have to go outside in and peel these layers off by accessing .x and get zero or what, what have you. Um, and, and that's a lot of work uh, compared, to, uh, compared to describing with patterns where you can just partially build the value uh, at, and, then, and then leave breadcrumbs along the way and say like, oh, if you match this, I want, I want, I want this portion of it. Um, and so the analogy that I like to make about this is that singing the alphabet forwards twice is a lot easier than singing it forward and then backwards, right? And so the argument is that um, by allowing you to build patterns inside out the same way as values, um, we, I think we, we reduce our cognitive load by about half. Uh, let's say, maybe more than half. Okay, so starting from here is the details of the paper. Um, we have three forms of pattern matching that we uh, want to see. First is one that you've seen uh, in previous slides is a statement form. You can inspect on an X and then you have different cases um, and the, uh, the pattern and the statement is uh, delimited by colon. It's pretty natural, right? Uh, the next one is the expression form, where you can do an inspection on uh, a value, and then you can use the, what we, we call it fat arrow. Um, and then the thing on the right-hand side has to be an expression. And um, it has similar rules as, why is it a flash on me? I don't know. Okay. Um, it has similar rules as uh, lambdas, where if you have multiple returns, they have to be the same type. Uh, and so in this case, they have to be the same type, both of them are strings. Yeah, Michael? Can you back one slide real quick? Yeah. Okay, I think right. um, so there's no syntactic difference in, well, uh, until you like parse the entire thing to tell the difference between a uh, expression and a statement? Yes. Is that an issue or is it just like? Um, I think there was feedback um, specifically from David that he would want to see like maybe parens instead of curlies. Uh, yeah, to dis to, to distinguish right. between yeah. statement versus expression before you get into the uh, to individual cases, um, 
I think, I think we'll need to do something there, um, but I'm not sure exactly what, because I think, I think parens are a bit too subtle. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, looking for ideas. Um, I, mean, like the, I think this is parcel is just complicated. Yeah. Is yeah. there a reason why you can't just have expression and have it and use it as an expression statement? Just use it as an expression statement. You can use it as an expression statement, but the case is the case that we want is for uh, for this thing to actually yield a value, right? No, she's saying let it always be an expression. Yeah, get rid of the previous one. I don't know what that. Oh, 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 I see. So, so like, so if we were to remove this. No, you keep it, but it's an expression. Well, yeah. well, okay. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I couldn't hear that. I'm saying we can't out of block scope here and do multiple things with an expression, so we need both forms, right? We need to do different things with yeah. just return the value. Right? I see, yeah. So, yeah. So, so Zach's comment is that statement would still be so useful. What's the separator between different patterns here? Is it just until you meet the next pattern? Um, is that the point? Yes, yes. So you could put multiple statements there. But if yeah, well, 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 through, well, through compo compound statements. Com you you, you would need you would need braces statement. you would need braces to introduce a compound statement and then you can have multiple statements, but it's still a single statement, right? So like a switch, the syntax for switch is just like switch, paren expression close paren uh, uh, statement, and then the statement can expand to a compound statement and then you need braces and then you can have multiple statements in there. Mm -hmm. um, but the but like the statement form is useful like it's, if you're inside of a loop for example and you wanted to break or continue uh, with the expression version you can do that. Um, so that would be. That's you don't need braces in the switch. You, need, you just have compound statements. Period. Sorry. You don't need braces in the, inside. The no, switch. you don't need it. You just, it's just a statement yeah. which you can. You multiple statements. You don't need. It's going basically to break in the next case because it uses case basically the next time you say case or default. So that's the reason I use the term block scope and not compound statement because you need the scope to introduce local variables. I see. Okay. Yeah. If you need local okay. variables, you put braces. But okay. You don't, you don't have to. Yeah, yeah. So the yeah, so the comment is that we actually don't need the braces uh, if we don't need block scope. So, yeah. So we might want to do something here to disambiguate, disambiguate early, uh, but both forms are for, forms are useful, I think. Um, so in the cases where expressions are can be different types, um, similar to lambdas, you you would have to specify the return type of that thing, um, and so this is a, this is an additional uh, piece of syntax that we would allow to consolidate to a single type. Uh, the resulting type. Yeah? Uh, I have a question. Isn't semicolon at the end of expression obligatory? Semicolon at the end of expression is what, sorry? No, it is obligatory. Yeah. Obligatory, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for yeah. yeah. uh, the previous forms, it was not. Uh, because it's a statement, it's the semicolon at the end is not needed for the statement form. Yeah, that's correct. Any other questions? Um, the, the last thing uh, that is actually not included in the paper, but we would like to uh, think through is the declaration form. Uh, what kind of patterns would we actually allow uh, in this initial edition? Um, so this is not allowed today, the nested structure bindings form, um, but we'll, but we'll go get into uh, the thinking around uh, what we would allow in here later. Okay, let's go through the overview of patterns. Disclaimer here, details, subject to change in new revisions. Um, it, most likely, will uh, a lot of things will change because we have feedback that says you know we don't like some of the some of the syntax and things like that. I kept the syntax in the paper as it were, um, but I marked them as red as kind of like contentious as to as to as to change uh, things like that. So primary patterns. So the wildcard pattern is surprisingly a very difficult problem, <laughs> uh, <laughs> as simple as of a, a job that it performs. So here it's double underscore. I hate it. Um, but maybe question mark, something else, I don't know. Um, but this is a placeholder for now. This is the placeholder that was used in P1110, which explored kind of how to do placeholders in general. Um, we also proposed P1469, um, which was to disallow uh, using underscore as the identifier inside structured bindings uh, to try to preserve uh, the use of that as wildcard uh, in, in pattern matching. Um, the feedback there was that we don't want underscore to mean different things in different contexts, essentially, was the, was the feedback, um, because underscore is already used as, um, 
as a placeholder for uh, GMock and things like that to mean I don't care uh, in, in various testing frameworks, right? So underscore underscore. I mean, I don't even need to explain what it does, right? But the actual the actual implications in C++ are pretty complicated. Um, anyway, it matches anything, gives you nothing, doesn't bind anything, uh, but it'll always match. And you can nest those. Um, identifier pattern, uh, this is also very complicated, but the semantics of it is that it'll match anything and bind the value that's being matched in that position uh, and give it a name. And the, na the, the rule here is exactly the same as structured bindings, so it's not a reference, it's an expression alias or whatever structured bindings does, which is a bit, which is a bit more than uh, giving you a real reference. Okay, expression pattern, um, you, can, you can match against literals, um, and this here is uh, to allow, the, the caret there is to allow arbitrary expressions uh, as patterns, and so if you have, uh, uh, let's say, zero and one variables, in order for the right-hand side to mean the same thing as the left, you would have to put caret zero and caret one um, in order for it to be refer refer referencing the previous variables as opposed to introducing new ones. They would need to be compiled by constants. Yes. The question was, does it need to be compiled time constants? The answer is yes. Could you show previous slide? Please? Yes. And what does x means? Uh, which x? This x? Yeah, so this, so this is introducing a binding for the thing that it's matching, which in this case is value. Oh, it's a variable name that's accessible on a inter expression on the right side. Yes. Is it like a structured binding, like just uh, it's a magic alias for? Yeah, you know, the question is, is it like structured binding, is it a magic alias? Yes, yeah, it's a magic alias. Okay, so, so let me go back. So here, um, if we have some value uh, in, as a pattern, right, the question is, well, how does it match, right? Switch, for example, will do something very different than, uh, sw sw switch will ignore your equal equals, basically, right? So if you were to define an operator equal equal for your enum, and you use a switch with it, switch will not care about how your operator equal equal is defined. So how does this work? Um, the one way to do it would be to do se sequence of equal equals, um, which is the default. Now, if we were to do that, then, then what I suspect is that people will write types like this within here and give it an e operator equal equal for int and within. And so the within here is uh, intended to capture a range. So we take two values, first and last, uh, 0 and 9, for example, and we're saying, uh, I want this pattern to match if the integer that I'm looking at is between 0 to 9. Yeah, Michael? Yeah, so you oh, don't Mickey? have the, right, I mean, whatever you want to call it in other languages, where, or you don't have the ability to put an if in addition to the max. This is how you can form an aware clause. Uh, you can. You can put the if afterwards as well. Uh, but, if you wanted to, but if you wanted the condition to be in place uh, for readability's sake, um, you could do something like this. So, so does everyone follow this example here? Um, is, so is match special? Yeah. Like the name match is special? Right, exactly. So the, so the, so the match function here um, is the thing that's going to be used to, uh, to see if a pattern matches a value. Right? If, not, if none exist, then we'll use equal equal. Um, and and, the, and, and the, main, um, main, main, the main idea is that we don't want incorrect equal equals uh, for the sake of making this work. And so we can provide a match customization point. Yeah? What do you think about providing a concept for one of these matchers? Providing a concept for one of these matchers. Well, what purpose would it uh, provide? Sorry, rather? I guess it would improve the specification here. Like, well, if, if within happens to satisfy this particular matcher concept, concept then you use this. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, it, uh, would it be worth? Would it be? Would it make sense to add a concept for uh, a matcher? Um, and I think um, it's not very clear to me what the difference is between what we're doing uh, now in terms of just requiring certain APIs and then collection of those APIs being a concept, right? Versus it being a real concept. Um, so like the way structured bindings works, the way it requires tuple size, tuple element, and get, like you could look at it as a conceptual concept 
structured bindable concept or whatever, but it's not a real concept, right? And, and in this case, like, if we, if we introduce a real concept, I'm not, it's not clear to me what the benefit would be, but conceptually, I have no objection to the, the idea. Um, I just don't know what the use cases would be. But maybe, I, yeah. Zach? So it seems like there is, like, as you said, there is an implicit concept here, which is that it has match, or otherwise I, I, I fail over to like double, right? So yes. But it seems like where a concept could be handy is if I'm somehow able to um, say in the, in the inspect uh, statement or expression, whichever, mm -hmm. somehow introduce the name of a concept that says the thing that I want to pick up must be whatever. It might be match, it might be matches, it might be some other. But I can't imagine how a concept definition would help if we only had one way of doing that. Yeah. Um, so the comment was that he doesn't see yeah. how the concept, or real concept, would be all that useful. Uh, yeah, question? Is why not to use a functional object instead of such token? Uh, I mean, uh, you, mean, you, mean, you mean, the question is why, why use match uh, as opposed to operator parents? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are other customization points. Um, and so, it's not clear to me that match is special enough for it to be operator parent. We'll get into the other customization points after. Um, they're called tr extract and try extract. We'll get into we'll, we'll, we'll get into those. But by customization point, you mean other other functions that you can add here? Yeah. Right. Right. Um, did you want to say something, Lisa? No. I, okay. In switch case statement, there is such a phenomenon as fall through. Yes. So the question is, uh, switch has fall through, does inspect have fall through, inspect has no fall through. Um, so it's always one branch only. Yes, yes. Uh, did you want to say something? Yeah. yeah how, uh, can match function be virtual? Can match function be virtual? Uh, uh, can we use polymorphic match, matches? I have not thought about that. Uh, the question was, can the match be polymorphic? Um, as specified, there's no reason for it not to be. But I, I don't know. But that's a good question. We should we should address that. Yeah, yeah, so Mickey. Yeah, something you like referenced earlier was like the ability of the compiler to tell you something is exhaustive. I mean, again, in other languages that have this, it, you know, the matcher being an expression that the compiler can look through and see yes. and tell your compilation. Right. Hey, bro, this isn't expand. This isn't uh, exhaustive. It's good. So I think it's one of the concerns about making it virtual is yeah, the compiler can't immediately go blah blah. Yeah. Hey, you know, yeah. Those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the comment is that uh, if we make it virtual, it would be even more difficult to optimize through this. Um, and, and I agree. Yeah, it would it would hinder optimization. Yeah, it might be sure. where context for virtual, because those rules are changing too. So right. Rules, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Um, so yeah, optimization could be hindered. Um, the, the, yeah. The only thing I'll say about it is that you know you you're kind of opting into the like difficult optimization cases. Uh, and if you want that, if you really need it, maybe I don't know. Um, but yeah, we, we, we do need to address that. Okay, any other questions? No? All right, let's move forward. Um, oh, super simple, parenthesized patterns. No, it's not simple at all, actually. Um, so parenthesized patterns uh, is, is used just to group things. Um, and so I have a silly example here, but, uh, but the real example would be if you have multiple nested, uh, nested patterns and you wanted to group certain things, uh, you could do that with parentheses. Um, so the concept is sim uh, simple, but you know, there are parenthesized expressions, so it gets difficult uh, just to use it as a gener general grouping mechanism. Uh, how does that differ from just putting zero there? What is the, what is the in, the, in the In the silly example? In the first case, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so the question is how does zero versus paren zero differ? Uh, there's no difference. And then in the second case? No difference there either. Uh, just sim the, yeah, these are just silly examples, but the real case would be um, if you have nested patterns and you want to group uh, visual, visual distinction of um, grouping of certain things inside nestings. David? Um, I think that it's true that you can always remove the parentheses and it means the same thing. Um, the comment is he thinks, uh, David thinks that it's always true that you can always remove the parentheses and it means the same thing. Um, I think, I think my answer would be it depends how well we do with the associativity of the patterns. Um, you know, in, in expressions, like because of those asso associativity of expressions, like removing patterns changes meaning, right? And so with patterns, I think it depends how, how well we, um, we'd, have to, we'd have to work through it basically. Um, I haven't done that work myself. Okay, 
uh, more interesting patterns. <laughs> Uh, one is structured bindings pattern. Uh, so this is familiar with structured bindings if you've used that, um, and pretty self-explanatory, right? So you can use uh, square brackets to introduce a set of patterns, um, and and the, and the and the observation here is that if you only have identifier patterns inside the square brackets, then you have exactly what what structured bindings is. Yeah. And when you Yeah the, yeah, the question is, uh, the, uh, are the patterns, uh, so all of the patterns that I've mentioned so far, can, can they be replaced, uh, mentioned inside the square brackets? And the answer is yes. Yeah. OK, number two. Oh. Can, can multiple patterns be true? Yes. And the first one listed will be selected. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the, yeah, so the, the question is, is the, is the matching um, happening first uh, in 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 order of uh, uh, first for our first match order versus best match multiple multiple patterns can match and the first one will win. Because zero zero matches all four of those. But it's, it's the first one this is it's clear first. Yeah. So yeah. So in this particular case, uh, the 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 fourth pattern of x y would match any value, but because zero zero comes first, that'll that'll match first. Um, so this is a cool one. Um, this is the designated, uh, designated, designated initializer syntax, but on the other side. And so if you have uh, multiple fields in your product type, uh, struct or whatever, um, and you wanted to, well, only struct, I guess. Uh, if you wanted to pull off only pieces of it and don't care about the other ones, um, then you can use the designated initializer syntax here uh, to inspect parts of, parts of your struct. And, and not necessarily have to break apart all of it with square brackets, uh, with structured bindings as they are today. Yeah? Uh, do you use a colon when you, when you construct an instance of player here? Would you say dot hit points colon one, or would you say dot hit points equals one? Uh, the question is, do you use colon when you construct the value? And the answer is no. During construction, it's equals. Um, we considered equals here as well, uh, but it, it, it seemed a bit odd. Uh, because we're not actually assigning anything, uh, so that's that's the reason for the for the syntax here. Yeah. So that begs a more general question because one of the things you mentioned about pattern matching generally before right. was that you want the creation of the thing to look like the pattern matching yes. thing. Yes. Right. But you have to choose different tokens here. Yeah. Why is that? Like, um, it, maybe it's a subtle question, but like. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I think I think ideally uh, we want the values to look the same as the patterns, um, but we already don't have that. Like we can't, like structured bindings looks nothing like a tuple construction, yeah. right? Um, and I think that the way, sh the, the step that structured bindings took was that, um, my interpretation of the direction that structured bindings went was that patterns operate on concepts. And so, and so the square brackets pattern operates more, more so on, um, uh, on, on, on product types as opposed to tuples or structs specifically. Um, and so, and so I think there ha there's inherent necessary reason for patterns and values to differ. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that's that, that's that's kind of a roundabout answer, I guess. <laughs> Any other questions on this? Yeah. Being inside of a struct layer, the hit points itself is a struct. Then in patterns, can I specify dot? Field, dot field, nested, nested, in a nested manner. Uh, sorry, so if you have a nested struct, yes. so if like hit points was a struct, for example, yes. um, then you would say dot hit points, colon, square brackets, and then whatever fields hit points has. Not, not colon, but dot hit points, dot so field, dot. That's not supported as we've specified it. Uh, so the question is, can you say dot hit points dot x, let's say, if hit points was a pair of ints? Um, uh, yeah, so the suggestion was, uh, or maybe not a suggestion, but the question was, uh, can you say dot hit points dot x to get to the x field? Um, and the question is, or the answer is, uh, as we specified it, no, you have to say dot hit points colon square brackets dot x colon something close, close, close square bracket. Yeah. Yep. Question. Sorry, say that again? We can work 
can work only with fields. For example, can we uh, run method, some accessory method to check uh, fields of the Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so the question was, can you only access the fields directly, or can you actually call a, uh, an accessor method? Um, as specified right now, you can't call an accessor method. Uh, uh, but, that's a, but that's an interesting and question. One question yeah. is, does it check uh, permissions? I mean, private, it expects it. So. Yes, yes. Uh, same, same rules as structured bindings. Yeah, so structured bindings wouldn't let you bind to private fields, for example, uh, unless you have visibility. Yeah, same rules apply, basically. OK. This is the part where we want to make variants more useful, um, or maybe more usable. So this is the typical use case uh, for variant, where you could use the angle brackets, specify the type that you want, uh, and then you can recursively match the pattern of the thing that gets uh, thing that's inside the inside the variant. So simple example here is uh, variant of int float. We're inspecting on that variant and then specifying int and float. Um, and i would be an int and f would be a float. An important uh, uh, feature here is that it behaves similar to std_visit, and so if you were to uh, have a variant int int and you and you inspect with an int, both of those cases would would dispatch to to this one handler. Nikki. And, and these the so if I wanted to say like int don't care whatever you're calling your double underscore thing does that work or is that just too special? Uh, int. Whatever you're calling you double. You so right so 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 your I question is. I don't care to capture the binding. End. Yes, you can do that. So, so uh, rather than you can replace i with underscore underscore here to ignore the thing inside. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know which one starts. Uh, will it compile if we uh, if we if we are trying to match uh, type that is absent in the writing? Type that For is example, absent. In this situation, if we match float, uh, will it compile? Yes. Um, so, well, there's more work to do there, but the 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 topic there basically so the que sorry I need to repeat the question so the question is can uh, if we were to add, ha add a handler for float here would it work um, and the question and the answer is that it would work um, because usefulness is not enforced um, and the reason for that is because if you were to um, let's say put this piece of code uh, inside of a template right then if you have handlers for uh, int float uh, string then you could pass that thing uh, variant of int string and you have enough handlers, you should be able to handle that. Um, and so that's kind of the motivation behind not necessarily enforcing usefulness. Yeah, I'm not sure you could. We need other data structures. Because for instance, let's say I have, a, I have my own class that I derived from standard variant. Mm -hmm. You have nothing you necessarily can inspect to see what types it can handle, unless we would have to provide. Uh, variant doesn't really provide that. We, yeah, we know it right. because that's how we designed the class. But right, right. in yeah. general, you would have to know yeah, yeah. So, take with somewhere to look at. yeah, so the comment is that um, we don't necessarily have all the information uh, if it's not, in the case where it's not a specific uh, variant where it gives you the type list. Yeah. Yeah. My question is, uh, are the angle brackets there to disambiguate the grammar, or is it just to call, like, make it more stand out? Um, the angle brackets there is uh, because we don't want those, we don't want int i where the i looks like a variable, because it's not. Um, the i is just a binding, right? There's no instance of int like in this scope. Um, and so the, that's a, that piece of syntax is partially for that. Um, the other thing is that, as you'll see, uh, we have uh, polymorphic type support as well as any support for this. And so uh, the, the, the inspiration for, for, the, for the syntax actually came from the fact that dynamic cast of t and then any cast of t you know, looks kind of like if you remove the dynamic cast and the any cast part of it, you end up with the angle brackets. Um, uh, same with get if, if you were to think about that, think about it that way. Yeah. Is there, there a template, I haven't thought through, is there a template support like auto or more importantly like concept maybe there? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, auto, this would, this would behave similar to if you, if you passed std visit a generic lambda and then uh, concept as well. So in this case, if you, if you have auto, um, because you have integral, you would, you would actually catch um, uh, bool, char, and int earlier. Yep, question? Uh, Wait, sorry, uh, do your first second. Can you remind how inspect part will be different in case if v is not variant, but if 
be is a union. How how would the inspect uh, how be inspect different? The inspect part will be different in that case. Um, so the question is, how would the inspect part be different if it were if we were matching against the union? And I don't. Well, so first of all, we don't support that um, because we don't know what the active yeah. member is. Yeah. But you'd have to supply that through some other means. Uh -huh. Right. So you could match on the on the tag or something. I don't know if you supply that. Sorry, one sec. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Union requires you to keep track of the tag. So yeah. The tag. So Either by reasoning it or storing it somewhere, some tag. So yeah. Have, yeah, somebody yeah. provides yeah. So if you have an explicit tag, you could match on that and then access it or something like that. Um, but yeah. Hannah? OK, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go and I can submit it in a, in a concept. How would it work with the? I can submit it in a concept. Stood any in a concept. That's not supported. No. Yeah, so the question was, how would, it, how would this work with stood any? It doesn't, is the answer. Uh, so let me go back a little bit. Um, this is uh, the constant expression case. Uh, so if we have variant end, end again, um, and you want to specify which one you want, uh, you could actually specify the constant expressions um, to specify the, uh, the index that you're actually looking for. Everyone okay with this so far? Good. All right, so next one is any, um, and any only supports type. Uh, so the way this would work is we would call any cast of int on uh, percent A, for example. Uh, and then it, if, it, if that matches, then we'll dereference the result and get the, uh, bind the I to it, et cetera. Yeah, sure. So is yeah. that a special language support, or is that a, for any, or does any provide some hook that tells it that yeah, so <coughs> the, yeah, so the question is, uh, is this special language support or is there some hook? Um, the answer is that I the modeling of this was, is kind of similar to structured bindings where there's a prior prior priority list. So structured bindings will first look for tuple size and then it'll try to do struct and then it'll fall back to array. Maybe it's the other way around. Um, but there's some priority list. Um, and so the way we would do this is we first look for variant size and then we look for any cast and then we would fall back to polymorphic types. And so, and so, and so any, any cast in this case is a, is a customization point. Can you overload any cast for using the types? So that, that was a piece of feedback. So the question is, uh, can you overload any cast for user defined types? I think as, oh. as, as today, Probably it's yes. not, well, is it true? You can, you can specialize like anything in the standard library unless we say no. I like can you overload it though? Unless you, yeah, you can, you can't. So as far as I understand, so as far as, uh, as far as I understand, overloading it is not allowed. Um, right. And so the, there was one of the feedback from Kona was, you know, don't do that. Uh, and maybe, so maybe we'll have to find a different, like separate customization point. Um, and, and, the, and David is actually working on like better customization points in general for variants and any and things like that. So hopefully we can get something there. Any other questions? Let's go to the polymorphic type ones. Um, so same syntax, uh, but instead of any cast, we'd be using dynamic cast. Um, so the check here would be is polymorphic, basically. And you can see the nested uh, pattern here, right? We can, we can match on the rectangle and then unpack it immediately uh, with a structured bindings pattern. Yeah, Mickey? So, okay, sorry. I, I, I figured out my answer. So, yeah, so this is a statement form. So you, it's not that you're returning the result of this expression through some implicit... Uh, yeah, so this is a statement form. Uh, you could, uh, yeah, uh, you could also write this in the expression form by saying return inspect shape and then fat arrows. And this is why it can't be an expression. Right. Good. All right. Um, so binding pattern. Uh, this is a, some of these are convenience patterns uh, where, so in this case, we're saying identifier at pattern. The at is red because I don't think we'll get at. Um, because it's outside of the current character set, uh, so we might have to fix something else. Um, but the, the idea here is that uh, sometimes you want to match on something, uh, but you still want the whole, uh, or the part that you were matching on. So if we were to have a variant of point and stuff, and we match on the point, um, and we break it up into x and y, on the right-hand side, you might actually want the entire point. Right? So rather than like, having to put the point back together with the x and y, you would like to actually capture point separately. Um, and so uh, P on the right-hand side would be, would be a point. X and Y would be, you know, int, int, or whatever. Yeah, question? Look at the green slide, please. Yes. So here, 
And so you'll expect there are return statements. Uh, yes. If we remove return keywords and use expect in place of a turn, ternary operator question mark color, it, will that work? Yeah, you could just do return inspect and put a semicolon. Uh, so if I write inside of it int a equals inspect shape and inside of inspect there are no return keywords. And yeah, yeah so, so, the question, so the question is can, can this be become an expression essentially? Um, and the answer is yes it can, uh, but you need fat arrows instead of colons and you remove the returns. So you would say int a equals ins uh, inspect shape circle blah 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 arrow 3.34, 3.14, blah, blah, blah. And that would work. So it will, it will require per parentheses instead of curly braces. Is that, is that what you mean? Well, the curly braces and the paren is up for debate. Um, but, the, but, but the thing that would syntactically change is the colon to uh, uh, equal greater than. That's the fat arrow thing we're talking about. Yeah, David? Yeah, the uh, and this, yeah, that's right. So the semicolon. So the comment is the semicolons at the end of return would become commas, um, and then at the close curly brace you would need a semicolon because the whole thing would be an, exp an, ex an expression. Make sense? Good. Okay, so everyone understand what the idea is here, where you want to potentially inspect but still keep a handle on the thing that you're inspecting. Okay. Yeah, so that's where it is. Um, the dereference pattern, uh, the star is also up for debate. Um, there was comment or feedback that it was confusing. Um, but I want to talk about the semantics of it rather than the syntax. Um, so this is where the dereference pattern is. Um, this is a silly example, by the way, so don't get tied up on the example. Um, so let's say we have a silly like uh, a single linked list. Um, we have some value and a node and a, and a next node, um, and we we're, we're going to inspect a node and say if I have a value zero, and if the next exists, and the value is zero, then I'm going to print zero zero, right? Silly example, but enough to demonstrate this point. Um, so what that means is the star there uh, uh, is checked, and so that the star pattern, uh, the pattern will actually start try to match if the thing that we're matching uh, actually is valid. That's so cool. <laughs> the comment was that, that was, that's so cool. So, <laughs> the question? Can you provide more, a bit more comments about the expression if next exists? Is it if next exists? Right, uh, yeah, so, uh, so the question is, can I elaborate on the next part? So what I mean is the unique pointer next, if that is non-null, then we will dereference the unique pointer and match the next node with the pattern. So if so if so if next was null, then then it, then then this uh, then this pattern would not match at all. Uh -huh. uh, se second value is up to dereferencing next. Correct. So the the, qu the comment is the second value is after dereferencing next. That's correct. Uh, yeah. Question. Don't match recursively. I mean, recursively. Do what recursively? Uh, I mean uh, traversal. Uh, is the question, can you traverse through the whole list with this? I didn't think about it. Just for next node or um, for all nodes? This is, uh, so, yeah, so the question is, is doing, for, doing it for all nodes? This is only for the next node. Oh, okay. Yeah. Everyone understand the semantics? Yeah. What's the reason that it does the null check instead of just putting a pattern in yourself that says that it's, I guess, could you put a pattern that says it's not equal to zero? But but you have so so the question is uh, can you just can you just check for it null uh, yourself yeah, is the, is that the question yeah. Um, yeah you could do that you could do you could do this in two separate patterns and say if it's null then don't do anything and then if it's if it's not null then then dereference the thing and do stuff um, but but oftentimes you actually like making that that sensitive if you have don't have the null null check then you're in UB land uh, would actually be kind of uh, usability wise might not be so good. So. If Zach? I to check for <coughs> just nullity, um, could I put stood null putter T or? or uh, it would be, uh, you would just put null putter there. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. All right. So this is the extractor pattern. We get to the extractor pattern. So um, the, there was a comment about match earlier. Uh, so this is where um, this is this is the extensibility aspect of it. So the syntax is open paren, constant expression, bang pattern, close paren, or you can do it with a question mark. So the matcher that we saw within only performs matching. Right? It doesn't provide any bindings for you. And so if you wanted to actually create some bindings, you would need to go through an un uh, one of these extractors to be able to create bindings into your, into your value. So there are two variants. Uh, one is unchecked and the other one is checked. So the bang is unchecked and the question mark is checked. So the, let me go move on. So uh, let's say we have some extractor E. And so if you say E bang P where P is pattern, then uh, P, you would match P against E dot extract value. Value is something that we're matching at the moment. E question mark P would say if auto result equals dot E dot ex try extract value, if that returns true, then dereference the result and match P against that. Zach? Is, is the semantics of result like uh, another um, match variance? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm only, I'm only just uh, showing the logic of stepping into it. Yeah. Oh, the, the question was, is, it, is the semantics of ma uh, result a magic alias? Yes, it's a magic alias. Okay, so let's, let's look at an example. Um, so the dere dereference pattern that we saw um, could actually be implemented in terms of a, uh, an extractor. So if you look at the deref struct here, we have an extract function that takes a value and returns star value, and try extract just returns the, returns the value that it got, right? So if we step through this, so, and then we can uh, uh, construct an instance of deref. So on the right-hand side here, um, the value in the next example, if we say deref question mark, then we will say uh, deref.tryextract node, which will just return node, and then we'll see if the node can, uh, 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 is convertible to bool, and if it succeeds, then we're going to dereference that and match p on the other, uh, other hand side, other side. All right? Everyone follow? And so if you wanted to have a, an unchecked version of deref, then you could say deref bang, which would call extract, which would not do this conditional if null dereference check. Yeah. So the motivation there was that um, given how uh, prevalent pointers are in C++, um, we wanted to have nice syntax uh, for, especially because pattern matching is going to be a useful uh, case for inspecting trees. And most of the trees have pointers. Um, and so that was the motivation yeah, to, make it, to make it a bit lighter on the syntactical load. Any other questions? I don't see I don't see that many frowns. So let's see. <laughs> okay, let's move on. All right. So CTRE, Hana gave a amazing keynote uh, two days ago. Let's see how CTRE could fit into this whole picture. Um, so at the top here, I uh, declared uh, struct RE, which has a track extract function which takes a string view, and I call CTRE match on it. And the result of CTRE match is just going to be my result. Okay. So, so we can create two of these, right? We can say RE of this reg regex, which is the number matching regex, and then another RE with uh, date, which would give you the um, date matching regex. And then you can put it into an inspect and give it, uh, use it as an extractor. So you can say number question mark, which would call number dot uh, try extract of the string, which will then go through CTRE machinery. And then what will come out is a fixed size container of the matches. Wow. I know, right? <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the, the comment from Zach was, wow. <laughs> Uh, I would like to capture that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you can see that in the date case, uh, you match, get the results out immediately. And this is something that you can't do with 
Sorry, did you have, did you say? It's, 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 yeah, so I say it'll get better. Um, so, so yeah, this is something that I can't do with pseudo regex because the results aren't uh, fixed size, right? I just get a vector-like thing, which I can't quite do this on. All right, so if CTRE were to implement try extract uh, inside this match, so CTRE match is actually a, an object, a, con a concept or object, context for object, and so um, with this API, if match were to implement try extract directly, then I don't even need my RE stuff, right? I could just say number is a match of that thing, which would have the try extract API, um, and then I can throw it into the inspect, and it would do what you expect. And then you could even inline this whole thing, right? Just say match this thing and get the results out. Do you need the present view here? Because of the I think so. question mark? Yeah. 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 This is, yeah, so like I'm not a syntac like syntactical wizard, so I like did what I could with my, within, within my abilities <laughs> with some help, but um, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure the experts can help. Uh, with the syntax. Yeah, question? Can you remind the meaning of the word ho here? Um, so CTRE match returns, uh, the, first, the first match is the full match. So. Yeah. So the whole is the is the first match of the regular expression, which is generally the the, the entire match, as opposed to the captures that you specified. Good. It's pretty cool, right? <laughs> I like this example. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, how many people were confused about the carrot issue? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of weird, right? Um, so I want to go into a bit of a design issue, a dis uh, design uh, space, and where like the decisions that we have to make, um, because the details, as I said, are subject to change. But there are design decisions we have to make as a whole, um, regardless. And so this is one of the this is one of the areas. So the the core problem is that identifiers are ambiguous. It's ambiguous where it's ambiguous where whether X here means an identifier pattern or if it means an identifier expression, right? And so um, there are several ways we can go about this. Uh, the, the, the approach that we took, obviously, as you see, was to disambiguate the expressions. Um, and, and, and I'll give a reason why. Um, but it's not an identifier-specific problem either, right? We can't just solve it for identifiers and move on because Without, even without identifiers, if, we, if I say one bar two, in a lot of languages, that means match one or two. Whereas in, for us, that means bitwise or. And so if we were to add a pattern like this, then even without identifiers involved, we have ambiguities as to what it means. So um, other languages have must, must have this problem too, right? Um, so Rust and Swift both have, both have this problem. This is a fun example, actually. So Rust. Uh, let's let, let's look at the, let's look at the Rust example, right? So let's, at, at, let x equals one bar two. That means bitwise or. So x is three. We match on x and we match on one bar two. But the one bar two there is a pattern. It's not an expression. So it's not going to match that. We 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 instead go to the otherwise case and we print otherwise. Okay. Swift took the other direction. So if we say let x equals one bar two, that also means bitwise or in Swift. That's three. And then we say switch x on case one bar two. The one bar two there is an expression. So now it matches, right? So these are virtually the exact same piece of code that has opposite, maybe not opposite, but vastly different semantics. So what, so what, do, what do we do? Um, so these are the two implications, right? So for us, uh, we said, well, we're, in, we're inside of an inspect. We're doing pattern matching. So patterns should take precedence. Um, was kind of the design decision that we made for this paper, at least, um, and and I think and I think it's a decent one. Uh, the other question is, do we want to allow arbitrary expressions? Like, how often do you want arbitrary expressions in your uh, in your in your as your case? So if we disallow arbitrary expressions, then we're only left with uh, disambiguating identifiers, 
And that's a smaller problem that we still have to solve, but it would be a smaller problem, right? So, um, but if we take Swift's, so if we go back, if we take Swift's direction, right, and say expressions that look, what's expression, what are expressions today are still expressions and patterns in, uh, inside uh, pattern, pattern matching, then what that means is we can't introduce pa new patterns that look like expressions. Right? Like Swift can't in the future introduce one bar two as a pattern because that would break code. Unless they don't care about backwards compatibility, but I think they do care about that. Um, and so the, the fear there is that expressions take up a lot of the syntactical space, right? And so to, to give up that entire space for like anything, any new patterns you want to come up with, you have to come up with new syntax. That's, that's, a, that's a real fear, right? And so, um, and so this is this is uh, this is the direction that we're in right now. So the at, so the so, so the caret symbol doesn't quite work um, because Microsoft something. <laughs> so so yeah, the question yeah, the first question. It's interesting. You took a binary prefix operator and made it a unary prefix operator. Um, why caret as opposed to double equal? Like, what did you consider? I'm curious. Uh, so the question is, what did you consider as the uh, ambiguation? Uh, token, um, uh, we consider things like equals. Yeah, I, we didn't really look at double equals. Um, the caret comes from a language called Elixir, which is a su successor to Erlang. Um, it's kind of cute in the sense that the arrow or the, the, the caret is kind of like a lookup operator, where you say like if if you say caret x, it means like the, the x is up there. Look up. I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the comment was that e double equals is used in Scheme, and uh, that's yeah, yeah, just as good. Um, did you want to say something, uh, Lisa? So I have, you know, sort of my dream pattern <laughs> set of patterns here, which maybe addresses this a little bit. Kay. I keep looking at this, and I really want a set of patterns that are parentheses less than expression, parentheses, less than or equal expression, in mm -hmm. close parentheses after the, the expression, parentheses, double equal expression, and you know, one for each of the relational operators. And oh, oh, I see, less, okay. That would make, say, dividing a number up into ranges yeah. so nice. Right, right, right. Okay, so Lisa's comment is that um, a range pattern would be really cool, where you could say a pattern would be like, uh, less than zero, and that would be a pattern that matches if the value is less than zero. Yeah. Um, and and have to, I think you might have to put it in parentheses just to right, get, right. Uh, avoid hitting the type. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you might need patterns for syntactical reasons, but conceptually, she wants to say stuff like less than zero to mean, um, which, so you could do that um, with the extractor stuff. Um, you could implement yeah. it. Um, and, but, the, but the comment, the actual comment was that um, if you had syntax like paren less than zero, close paren, then you could leverage that to say equal equal means what we want to mean here. Mm -hmm. So I think I understood that correctly, right? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I think Mickey was first. And then yeah, so this is what I was asking earlier. I mean, the way that like a lot of functional languages handle this is like, it's a, you can call it an if or a where clause, where you have like bindings, and then you'd say if x less than zero, or whatever binding you had, right? Right. And that's how <coughs> this is ambiguous. Um, in Scala, and I think. Yes. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's guys, it. Yeah, so for all of that stuff, y yeah, you would need the extractor or a matcher with the downside of that being like, you know, that you're back to the, the, the variant one from before, right? Where you like, un, you got to pull out, okay, wait, what is this statement doing? Is it look somewhere else? Like it delocalizes it. Right. It's harder for compilers, it's harder for humans. Yes. In all ways, other than like, you know, it's a crazy feature, it's harder for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the comment is that a lot of languages allow um, what's typically referred to as pattern guards, um, where you can say pattern uh, and, then, and then an if, or sometimes it's a when, uh, and then you can put an arbitrary Boolean expression after that, uh, where that entire thing would match if the pattern matches as well as the pattern guard matches. Um, so it's, it is, that is also part of our paper. Um, I, so, so, so the syntax is pattern if uh, yeah. Boolean expression. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that is, that is the approach that a lot of languages take. Um, so it's a valuable op option so also. why not? Um, so if you think about, so I think the local 
So there's the, there's the lo locality of the code, but there's also locality of patterns. So consider, for example, um, if I say match tuple with pattern x, y, x. That's pretty clear what it means, right? If I say match pattern x, y, z if x equal equals z, like it, structurally it doesn't, I can't tell anymore. I have, to, I have to reason through the Boolean expression again. And so there's, so I'm getting at the part, fact that like when you, when you localize stuff that you mean inside the pattern, um, I think it's easier to visually inspect. Yeah, um, you can do both, right? Like the, you know, having the ability to say in the bindings these two have to be equal doesn't preclude you from saying, in, you know, x, x and x, oh yeah, also over here, I want to say that x is equal, right? Like the structural, like saying things that are purely structural to be in the pattern, unambiguous. Okay. Things that are not structural, but rather relational, are outside of the pattern. Like adding the pattern guard doesn't preclude you from having structural matching. Right. Well, but, well, yeah. So as I said, pattern guards are part of the paper. Yeah. So okay. I, I was just saying that, so the, the part I was asking is why are you so okay? So you have them, but you didn't show them. So you're not going. Like, it's something you propose, but aren't actually going forward with. No, no, we, no, we, no, no, we are. Um, okay. So but. Yeah, yeah, um, it's going to be part of the part of the proposal going forward as well. But David want, maybe wants to um, say something. Just want to circle back to what Lisa was suggesting. Okay. One drawback of that approach is um, is if you're inspecting and matching against your enumerators, like you know, you, you inspect a, a enumeration value, and you want to just have different cases for different enumerators. For every single one of those cases, you have to put left parenthesis double equal the name of the enumerator, right parenthesis, which is a very heavy syntax for something which is really common. So the nice thing about care is you just put care and then the enumerator. Yeah, so David's comment was that um, the, oh sorry, yeah, uh, the syntactical overhead of the paren relational operator identifier close paren or expression close paren um, would be pretty heavy syntax for common cases like matching on enumerations, enumerators. Okay, so let's see, if some time, let's do it. <laughs> so the declaration form um, is an interesting area to kind of think through um, because we want this feature to be awesome, which means it should be cohesive through the language. So first we need to talk about refutability. Um, what refutability means is a refutable pattern can fail to match for some value. So examples are literals, uh, if you have literals inside uh, compound patterns, or things like variants that would potentially not match, right? Um, on the other hand, irrefutable patterns cannot fail to match for any value. So underscore, uh, underscore, underscore <laughs> is, uh, is an example of that. Um, ID expression uh, or uh, compound patterns that consist of only uh, irrefutable patterns could remain irrefutable. So what does this, what, what does this mean? So we go back to this, right? This was the, the, the essence of patterns. It matches or binds, or it matches and binds. Uh, but you know, refutable patterns match and bind, but irrefutable patterns actually don't match at all. It just binds stuff. And so that's the idea. Um, and so if you're only binding stuff, then, then there's, no, uh, there's no potential for failure. And so the, the backporting of patterns to declaration, declaration form would be, you know, today this is true. Right, auto irrefutable pattern equal ex equals expert. Our irrefutable patterns that exist today are ID, ID expression, right? Or structured bindings, which only have irrefutable patterns, which are identifiers. And so, obviously, this is not how it's specified, but conceptually, this is how we could think about um, how it works today and how it all fits together. And then. And so, and so at this point, we have to ask, like, well, which of these patterns can actually go into structured bindings or, or go into variable declarations? And, um, and what we would say is that irrefutable patterns can go. And so it's things like extractor, extractor patterns or the field matching patterns, for example, uh, we, could, we, could, we could backport. backport. Um, but this gives us a framework as to what's possible. Um, the question, the next question then is, uh, can we allow refutable patterns in here, and what would that mean? So, <laughs> throw an exception would be one. Some languages do this. Uh, Scala, for example, will let you put re refutable patterns into that variable declaration. If it doesn't match, it throws a no, no, no match uh, exception. 
Some other languages do that as well. Um, in the case of Rust, Rust doesn't allow you to do uh, put refutable, refutable patterns there uh, at all. Another option would be to just make it UB, but I don't know. Uh, so I think in terms of like how it fits together with what's there today, I think irrefutable patterns work uh, pretty well. So that's all I have so far. Um, I'll go to questions. And if, you, if there aren't questions, I have some more stuff. Any questions? Yes. So yeah, so um, can you go back to the, you had a couple of those funky ones, like the try extra the extractors, and then there was one other like extra go-go gadget string. Go-go gadget string. <laughs> uh, is it like over here? Did you refer, uh, yeah, so, so do you reference pattern MRI with extractor? So yeah, okay, so for the extractor, for example, like, oh yeah, the extractor, for example, yeah, let's go with this one. Yeah. Um, why, if you have guards, do you need this contraption? Why through? Why, if you have, if you have like, um, like you know, match guards, why do you need this contraction? For? So, so think about how this would be. This example would be written uh, with with matchers. Um, we yeah, would. Yeah, so you would. So you would. I'm saying. So you'd have dot. You know, dot zero. Dot next. Um, so you're saying. Yeah. So you'd say what? Uh, so let's say dot next colon next, and then we would say if. Right. And then the the inspection of the stuff inside next. Like we wouldn't be able to leverage this pattern here, because we're inside the match guard or a pattern guard land, and we can't, like, we can't like access the thing and then give it back to a pattern to get the pow power of patterns back. Yeah. Uh, Is that clear? Uh, Please. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong about this. With an extractor, you could say match. A, you could match against the last element of a linked list by actually walking down the, you know, in the extractor, you have code, you could walk to the end and hand back down. Yes, you could do that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. So I guess that, so that's back to earlier. So I mean, the way you would do that in a, you know, a language that had more powerful structure binding would be, you know, you would just do the whole, you would have a variable structure binding. Like that, I know that's a whole nother can of worms that you know, no one wants to, uh -huh. but yeah, like the, that's usually, you don't need this contraction in most languages because that problem is solved with something else. The problem um, I want to match against the last thing is solved by you say like whatever would be the syntax for star don't care you know and here's the last element I actually care about so this yeah. binds to everything else you match right. against the last guy. Uh, I I mean uh, that's you true. Do this last non-zero element yeah. or something. Yeah. So 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 the so, uh, so the so the concept of extractors actually come from Scala. Sure. Um, uh, and so you could take a look maybe there. Um, uh, for I don't know different perspective on extractors and, and other languages. Was, uh, matchers. So what were the what were the that, that was the other one I was so yeah extractors I was I'm okay with. Okay. Um, so, so matcher was the within example. Yeah. So this one. So for this one, this mm -hmm. seems like this is where the like a guard makes sense. Uh, yeah. So it yeah it, it could yeah. I mean, the reason there's why no I like it better. It's just that, like, yeah, localization, and then I, I like the fact that the compiler will warn you better, or at least it can. I mean, because I'm, 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 sure I'm not sure what you, I'm not sure what it can do though, because it would have the exact same. I mean, you would just have this piece of code yep. here. There, yeah. Like, how does that help the compiler? Well, because the idea being, I mean, so in this case, yeah, you have the greedy thing under, right? So th this will always be fine. Like, if this is something that doesn't match, but if you have something. That's actually a closed range, right? Like here, you have to have to be the case that it's in, so it matches everything. Mm -hmm. But I could foresee again this being with, you know, enums or all, all the other kinds of things. Like by pulling by pulling it out, it makes it harder for the nice check when it says, "Hey, this isn't exhaustive," right? Yeah. Um, so the, yeah. So the comment is uh, localization seems to take a hit here, and I and I the way I look at this honestly is like um, analogous to a function. Yeah. Like you can. You can you can inline like describe your conditions every time, but if you have a common case that you have a lot, then you factor it out, sure. right? So in that in the similar sense, like maybe this particular example isn't a good good one, um, but my point more so is that you can factor out common conditions that you're checking for rather than inlining them to every if uh, uh, pattern guard. You can you can factor it out. Yes, yeah. that's, that's the concern. Is just the indirection makes it so like by allowing indirection, it makes it so that way you don't necessarily you can't do the close thing. But you're saying what like. If that's if 
that's what you want. You, you give up the fact that the compiler can look into it and give you a warning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Show, show right. Your own right. Yeah, David, I'll get to you. He had his hand up, his hand up for a while. <laughs> Did Sorry. you consider playing around with the ellipses so that you can match sequences and then bind them to span? Um, yeah, so... Uh, I just, just say no, but it's... Yes, it's no. Um, so, 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 so the question is, did we consider ellipsis? Um, so there's a proposal to extend structured bindings um, so that you can say like auto square bracket dot 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 xs close bracket equals expert, um, where expert would be some tuple or whatever. No, so, I mean like as a suffix where you, you match multiple instances of a pattern and then if you have binding. Yeah, yeah exactly, I'm getting there. So, uh, so, like, so like in structured bindings, if you can say dot 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 x's to mean repetition of the identifier pattern, Right, then you could say like, like this would be a, this would be a next step. But you could say dot 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 square bracket x comma y close square bracket, mm -hmm. which would match like sequence of pairs. Yes. Right, and then like maybe x and y on the right hand side are like you know packs of matching the first elements of the pairs that came in, and y would be a you know second elements of the pairs that came in, that and so like there is some inter interesting evolution there. Um, but like on the surface of it, you know, just allowing dot 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 without a pattern involved would already be useful um, to ignore. You know, if you just say x comma dot 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 to mean I want the first value of a tuple of a generic tuple inside of, inside of a template, for example, right? Which you can't do that with structured bindings today. David. Uh, so going back to what's your name? Mickey. 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 Okay, back to, to Mickey's comment. So one of the uh, motivations for having this, I mean, we could just use the, the if thing afterwards, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. And put within 0, 9, and then you have you bind something here instead. Yeah. Um, if we didn't have this feature, um, and, and that's really largely an aesthetic issue, you know, whether you're going to introduce a name there or not, eh, some people like it one way, some people like it the other way. Um, but if we don't include this, the people who like it this way are going to abuse double equals to make it so this works anyway. So, right. so one of the thoughts behind the, including this in there is rather than having people abuse double equals, just go ahead and let people opt into it. Yeah, yeah. that's sensible. Yeah. So David's comment was that um, the motivation for this uh, matcher uh, stuff is because otherwise, if we don't introduce it, then people will um, abuse double equals uh, for to get this to get what they want. Yep. This proposal proposes to introduce at least two new keywords, inspect and map. Is that right? Uh, match is not a keyword. Oh, oh, oh well, that's, that's, that's just a function name. Then how inspect understands that exactly that function needs to be followed? So it's, so it's similar to, so the question is, how does, how does inspect know to reach for match? Um, the, the answer is, it's similar to structured bindings, where you know, when you have a language feature that hooks into some specific API that it's going to call, like get. Match is a magic right. function name. Mm -hmm. Also, so is a is a that, that is already in the language as a magic keyword name. It's not, it's a a magic keyword. no, it's not a keyword. So inspect, inspect would just try to call match. But like, like begin and end and get. Right, exactly. So it's like begin and end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like a range-based for loop where you, you have to opt in by specifying begin and end. Begin and end, there aren't like keywords or anything for just knows the range base for just knows to you know hope that it's there and try mm -hmm. right <laughs> yeah david so it's targeted for uh c plus so the question is when can we use this um so the feature is targeted for c plus 23 um i think that as the proposal matures um hopefully we can allocate more resources to get a prototype um, and then you could, I don't know, play with it around in a Clang branch or something. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe on Gothelt. That'd be cool. Yeah, question? So do you expect the performance to be similar to, I don't know, Handwritten or whatever? Because like Varian doesn't allow you to specify, you know, the post you have to generate the code for it. But here you can have, you know, way more complex scratching in the end. Yeah. So, uh, the question is, uh, what do you expect uh, the performance to be like? Um, the, the answer is, if there are definitely more op optimization opportunities. Uh, so for example, if you have a 
um, sequence of uh, structured bindings, then you could actually do column-wise optimization to do a switch over the columns uh, rather than uh, evaluating them in order. Um, if you have stuff like this, where you have like custom, custom code getting into your matching uh, logic, then it more or less would revert to um, if else if else chains. Um, but a lot of in so for example the polymorphic type case, um, the Mach seven uh, library that Yuri, uh, Bjarna, and Gabby worked on, they have a mechanism to like cache the results of dynamic cast to make that stuff faster, and that stuff is enabled by adding more structure to to, to the analysis, right? And so um, I expect the polymorphic case to be much faster, um, and you know things like matching on integrals should should be no slower than or it should be exactly the same as switch, um, and so it's kind of a opt-in as you uh, as you want kind of situation for optimizations. Any other questions? Yeah, David. Um, why didn't the single underscore work? Yeah. So the question is, why is the single? Why did the single underscore not work? Um, the answer is the single underscore like is used in libraries today. So like Gmock has, um, what is it called? Uh, I forget the namespace name, but oh, it's like test 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 testing colon colon underscore. And so um, the way you use that is like. Uh, Try to call, like call expect that this function will be called with these arguments, and for this one I don't care, and so you'd put an underscore there, and so because it's a valid identifier name today, um, like it, we would have to make it such that it the underscore inside inspect has different meaning. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, and so all underscore is reserved for implementation, so it's kind of yeah. le, le, it's kind of right. less impact. We can you know, less yeah. we have to bother to yeah yeah. Um, it's, a, it's hard. I mean, yeah, and it's one. Th oh, the other thing I would say is that it's one thing to make it context sensitive inside inspect, but when we start to think about the language as a whole, um, in the declaration form, like now, now auto underscore equals, like that can't be a context that we like steal, yeah. right? Um, I can see why you don't like it though, because double underscore is almost as bad as like two white spaces. Oh uh, yeah, exactly. It's terrible. I had a silly idea though, where you can have two or more underscores and you can align things. Wow. <laughs> Don't, no, don't do that. <laughs> Any other questions? I think I have. So I guess I will go one time. I think we have two minutes. Question, question back to you. Like, what was something that you, because you said you were trying to shop something, like what's, what's a pattern or something you were trying to express that you couldn't figure out something for, just to like throw it out to the world? Sorry, could you repeat like, the question, please? Sorry. Like, you know, it seems like you guys have a, you know, thought through a lot of these things, but like, what was the, you say you try to shop around. So what's a pattern or a concept that you're trying to express here that you sort of haven't really been able to accomplish or you're, you're good, you match everything you ever want? Um, <coughs> I think, I think, so the question is what uh, patterns did you try, did you want that you didn't quite get or something like that? Right? Yeah, like you, you said you're trying to like throw Yeah, um, so, so, so the one thing that I'm still like not so happy about is that the, the extractor stuff is like very, very powerful because you essentially inject like arbitrary booleans back into the structure. Um, but what that means is that you don't have access to all of the patterns that are in scope. So in the CTRE example, for example, um, the CTRE match of number and date, like doing those separately would be two separate runs of CTRE as opposed to if you had access to all of those patterns, you could just create a single regex with a bar and then run it through CTRE once and then get your answer, right? And so like, we lose some optimization abilities across patterns, but enabling that would be crazy for library, uh, library writers to like, account for that, right? Um, and so we went for simplicity there uh, and also allowing for power, but yeah, that's something that's kind of like, uh, I don't know. I think it's okay, but maybe it could have been better. Uh, or maybe it could still be better. Um, yeah, and the and the other one is that is the uh, dot 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 that would be really useful. Right, yeah, that, that's on you guys. Right? That's on like structured bindings. Like I, I mean, I would never see it, but I, you know, every time that's why I wasn't gonna put it down. I'm never kind of like people are like, oh yeah, we need that. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, preferably all of it would be cohesive and move move forward together. Sure. Yeah, um, I think I'm out of time. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.